we do have pieces of helping them with handling their feelings. So if you saw him being super sad or disappointed to honor that, like, I can see you're really disappointed and you wanted to get in there like your other brother and sister or whoever it was. And Mm -hmm. it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be discouraged, like letting feelings be okay. And sometimes you do that. I do that first. Because once, what do you want to do is say, it looks like you're feeling sad or it looks like you're feeling discouraged and you want to wait for a recognition response from your child. So when you land on the feeling, like if, if he was sitting there and, you know, kind of like this and you said, oh, you must, you, you look like you're feeling bummed about not making it. And if he goes, yeah, that's when you've handled the feeling. So that's what you're looking for. You're throwing, you're lobbing out possibilities, how you think he might be feeling. And you're going to look for this, oh, like you get me. You understand me. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday Podcast. Today, we're joined by Debbie Godfrey. Debbie, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm super excited. Oh, as am I, and I know Brian too, (laughs) just being, you know, parents. (laughs) I look forward to the information that you're going to share with us tonight. Great. Me too. Who knows what's going to happen? Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I can say I certainly know what's going to happen next. And what's going to happen next is we're going to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. So we'll start by asking, who is Debbie Godfrey? Oh, it's so funny that to ask it in that way, it's like, yes, who am I? I'm so many people. But I think one of my graduating classes of parents one time gave me a card and, and it's funny because I teach adults. So it's not, you know, how children bring their teachers apples and stuff like that. And, and I get gifts sometimes and it's just so heartwarming and I love it. And it, it is very sweet. And one time a group of parents gave me a card that they all signed. And on the outside of the card, it just said like a hundred times it, you know, it had these lines and it said, wake up, do nice things, go to bed, wake up, do nice things, go to bed. And I was like, Oh, they get me. (laughs) (laughs) And really, I mean, that's kind of like if, if I had to say who, who is my best self, that's what I love to do is be of service to help people to do nice things. And sometimes in big ways, like, you know, teaching my classes and other times it's just smiling at somebody on the street or helping somebody that's struggling or, you know, just being out in the world today, I was getting my roots done and the lady to chairs over, like her hair was looking really pretty. And I just went over and said, Oh, your hair looks so good. And she just lit up, you know? And so I think that would encapsulate me in my whole life is just that I feel good when I do for others. Hmm. So I have to ask, okay, <laughs> children, you have children. I do. I have three grown children. Okay. So they're 30, 36, 31 and 30. Okay. And I have five grandchildren Sorry. from ages seven down to one. And well, he's 15 months now. Okay, great. So you've been there, done that. And now you get to watch your kids do it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I tell you the whole time I used to teach parenting when my kids were growing up and I started when they were one, two, and six, that's when I had my first parenting class and I just loved what I learned. And I started a parenting breakfast club with my neighbors. And I, I, you know, just was, this was the thing. And at a certain point I said, God, give me work that I love that makes a difference in the world and lets me be home after school for my kids. And this kind of all fell in my lap. So I've been teaching for a long time and all of those years when I, my kids were growing up and I was teaching classes, I was like, I was so passionate. And my philosophy was we teach best that which we most need to learn. <laughs> and I always said, that's why I'm so good at this. <laughs> and, and, you know, t- and the teaching and, it, but I was, you know, I always was like, well, it feels right. And it, you know, this feels so right to do this, but I don't know. Like, I don't know. Cause my kids are still, I'm still in progress. And it wasn't until they grew up and First, when my oldest became a mother and to see what kind of mother she was, it was amazing. And my middle daughter, who most of the stories I share in my classes of 
everything that went wrong <laughs> related to my middle daughter <laughs> and the power struggles and the fighting. And I have so many great success stories with her because of having this. If I didn't have this, our relationship would be a wreck. And so to, to have this and to have the relationship I have with her and know it was 100% because of what I learned and what I taught with positive parenting. And then my son has two kids as well. And to see him be a parent and, and now like when that all, when they all grew up and I had this, oh, and all three of them call me for parenting advice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my middle daughter who doesn't have kids yet, she nannies and she works with kids and they all call me and I'm always amazed because like, wow, you're calling me because, you know, they're my kids, right? Yep. I don't think, you know, I don't think of myself as the expert with, with them. They're, they're my kids, but they do, they actually, they respect what I do and they want to know what I think. And that blows me away. And so that, that's when I became in my own mind, the expert is when I really believed and saw this because of the results that I got when they grow up. So positive parenting, <laughs> what's your take on that? Well, my take on it is that it's a way to discipline that doesn't use punishment, first of all. So like takes that whole punitive, like, I feel like kids are not criminals. So why are we setting them up for this criminal paradigm? And I think that's a lot of the problem in our world is that we're setting kids up thinking they have to pay for what they've done wrong. And that's, that's a, that's a criminal thing. Like that's when you grow up and you get, you, you know, you do bad things. You have to pay for what you've done. Children are not criminals. They're misbehaving and their misbehavior has a purpose. They have needs that are not getting met in some way. They're struggling. They use their behavior to get their needs met. So I see positive parenting as a way to discipline that behavior when they're making mistakes or they're behaving in a way that's inappropriate to the situation and that we can discipline them and use kind and firm discipline, not punitive discipline, and discipline that corrects the behavior. And at the same time, it builds our self-esteem. And that's the magic to me. Because when we had the old, what I consider the old forms of punishment, mm -hmm. spanking, yelling, and all those things that, that you know, I've put a, I put aside when I started doing positive parenting, like those things can work with some kids, doesn't work with all kids, but it works with some kids. But when it works, there's usually a secondary problem. And it's usually a long range problem that disrupts our relationship. It creates the lack of trust, um, the fight or flight that it creates biochemically in their bodies, because it's, we're using fear to, to motivate them. So it shuts down a lot of their cognitive learning and there's long-term problems with that. So I see it as, you know, a lot, a lot of people say, oh, it's abusive. Well, it's not exactly abusive. I just see it as kind of mediocre. Like it's not the best we've got. Mm -hmm. We could do, we could do better. To, to help them be more responsible and respectful and smart and intelligent. And it, and it takes away the intelligence. It's easy to spank or yell. It's not always easy to do a positive parenting thing because you have to think and you have to pay attention to the situation. You have to take classes to learn what to do. And you know, like it just, it's not the parenting that comes naturally to us. And so that's what I see. It's, it's disciplining that builds their self-esteem and doesn't break their spirit. And so it keeps our relationship really close and connected, which is so important when they become teenagers. Mm. Yes. And we are on that verge. We have our 12 year old that is, we were saying, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we won't use him as exhibit a, but if you have anything to say in regards to preteens, you know, you can always share as this conversation unfolds. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the the main thing is number one, the first time I taught, I have a workshop for parents of teenagers and it's called that's it. You're grounded, which I don't, I don't, mm go along with grounding, but it's the title that's supposed to be catchy. That's it. You're grounded effectively, effective communication with teenagers. And the first time I taught that my daughter with my oldest daughter was nine. And so it was way before she was a teenager. And so much of it, I'm so glad I had, and I was prepared for, because I don't think that they just magically turn into a teenager at age, age 13. Like many kids are already exhibiting those behaviors mm -hmm. much sooner. And some kids are late bloomers and might not exhibit them till later. But I think getting on board with it sooner rather than later, I was super glad that I had. And a couple of the things are just related to understanding their developmental stages as a teenager. And I go through, you know, eight or 10 developmental stages that are related to, to some of their kind of strange behavior they do. But the one that always gets me is 
that they become omnipotent and omniscient. So they know everything and they're all powerful, right? They, <laughs> I know, I know. And, uh, and we get in fights with them because we try to, you know, we go at that with them. And when you understand, like, this is a development of that teenage brain, which has some limitations and they don't actually, our, our brain doesn't actually completely mature till around age 24. Mm -hmm. And so this actually goes on beyond teenage years, but it does usually peak right in those, right in those teenage years. When you see them doing this, I know it all, or, you know, don't try to tell me anything that to just realize, wow, my child really can only see this one way right now. Like literally their brain doesn't allow them to see another perspective. And, you know, I have some compassion for that. Like what a bummer to be so limited. You know, it's, it's nice to grow up and have more <laughs> expansion of opportunities <laughs> beyond, beyond what, you know, what our, what our teenage brain will give us. And so I remember one time with Brie, Mariana, she, she was doing this thing of, and I, and I remember saying to her, wow, Brie, I can see that the way you're seeing it right now is the only way you can see it. I get that. And, you know, I understand that if you ever wanted to see another perspective, let me know. And I walked off, like I didn't try to push my perspective on her. And she came after me. She's like, okay, what? Cause I think she didn't really want to be seen as closed minded. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was a little tricky. I was kind of working with it. And again, you know, and, you know, and she was much less of a um, headbutting type of child anyway. Like, I don't know that my middle one would have come seeking my, my opinion like that, but, but that one diff definitely did. No, definitely uh, interesting stuff. Now, the thing that I'm kind of curious about now, mm -hmm. obviously we've talked about a lot of the, some of the benefits of what, you know, you've been able to teach folks now. I, I guess, and I, I want to make sure I frame this the right way, because I like to ask people as well about the failures. So what are some of the failures that you encountered over, over your time parenting that oh you've gosh, been able to, uh, to benefit from it and, and really be able to, uh, I guess, get those enhanced learning experiences that you could share with others from? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I actually, this, I, th that thought went by my mind a couple months ago. I remember thinking, should I put on there? I can talk. I don't remember. There was some reason I was thinking about that. Cause I, I mean, I have a lot of like in the moment failure failures, like there's times where I've yelled at my kids, right? There's times I didn't spend, once I decided not to spank anymore, which when they were little, I haven't spanked again, but I definitely have lost my temper and yelled. Right. And, and even with the grandkids, and as many years as I've been doing this, like it's, we're human. And mm -hmm. the That's idea it. is to stretch and to try our best. And, and for me at this point, if I get pushed to that limit, I know something's really wrong either with me or with the situation. And so I stop and really look like, first thing I look at is me. Am I overtired? Am I stressed? Mm -hmm. it, you know, am I not taking care, care of myself? Am I trying to do too much? and assess that. Beyond that, I'll look at the child and say, wow, this child's super discouraged and I need to take more time and more patience because I'm obviously not doing that and I'm having too high of expectations of them. So I think I'm better at evaluating that type of stuff. But one huge failure I had, and there was, there's no fix for this. Like I, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that you're asking me this because I don't get to share it very often because most of the time I share failures that have like good endings and I, maybe it has a good ending I guess sort of but I almost feel like I could have been you know like caught by CBS for abuse or something so, <laughs> <laughs> so all is well now so we're good <laughs> so so we were in Hawaii and I had like three or four trips with my three kids to Hawaii first it was like a cheerleading competition. So we all went and then it was like a hockey competition with my son and we all went. And, and other times when me and my, my oldest daughter went for, I had a conference or something. So I had a, this series of trips to Hawaii in the time my, you know, when my kids were between say eight and 13. And one of these trips was the result of getting four free plane tickets. Cause one of our flights was delayed a day and a half. And so I'm like, Ooh, free free tickets. We're going to Hawaii. We're having a vacation, like no hockey, no cheerleading, just us. And so I rented this really cool whole floor of a three-story house at the end of a private road in, in Kauai. And we went for two weeks because I, I had free tickets. I got a cheap place and 
and we, I, you know, get there, I go to Costco, load up on food. So I, we've got a big <laughs> kitchen. I, you know, I've got it all down. We had a, we had the Kauai guidebook and every day we'd pick a different beach and we go, and it was just like dream. And I, I just, it was awesome. And my middle daughter was making it miserable. So she would cry, she would scream, she would yell, she would somehow every day she would sabotage all of our fun. And we were all super mad at her. I'm at my wits end. I said to her, you know, a few, not more than a few times, if you don't do this, I'm going to leave you at the home. And she was probably 10 at the time. I'm going to leave you behind. And I teach. And most of the time I, you know, I tell parents don't threaten something you're not willing to do. <laughs> right. And so I started really thinking, am I willing to do this? And at the point, probably five days in where she was just awful, I did it. Like I was like the end of day four or day five, I don't remember which one it was. It was like, that was so miserable, Michelle. I'm sorry, but I am not willing to take you tomorrow. Like we just want to go have fun, snorkel, play, swim, whatever. And I, I can't do this anymore. And I left her there and she kind of cried and she you know, I don't, I don't think she was screaming or anything, but I worried about her all day long. I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> you didn't really get that piece. <laughs> no, <laughs> was, you know, you know, how, cause you're a parent, like you're going to flash all the, like somebody's going to come and she's going to, or she's going to run off or, you know, who knows what. And, and I left her there and we went out and did our thing. And I, you know, I managed to get through the whole day and we didn't have all the fighting. It was super peaceful and great. And we came home home and she was still alive she was still there <laughs> <laughs> and thank god because i look back on that i'm going did i really do that i guess i really did <laughs> and uh and end of story she shaped up so the rest of the trip was awesome so it, it did work out in that in that it fixed her behavior but i think that was a super bad thing i did <laughs> I Everybody think, lived to, to tell the right? story. And they, yes, luckily, thank goodness. I was a young mom, so <laughs> <laughs> that's my excuse. Oh, man. Anyway. But you know what? It, as you were telling that story, it made me think of dynamics of children, right? So we have four kids. Obviously, we all know they are all totally different. And then with the age, age ranges, it's tricky, right? I like say so much, especially to my oldest, like, when he's like, oh, you to the five-year-old, you're so annoying, you're so this. I'm like, you were that kid. There was just <laughs> nobody to tell you you were annoying other than us. And we wouldn't do that because we're the parents, right? right? So can you, I don't know, give us some information, advice on how to deal with the, the dynamics of children and just their interactions on a day-to-day -day basis? Anything as parents we can help facilitate there. Yeah, especially in terms of just the uh, the different stages based on mm -hmm. based on kind of their ages and their mindsets. Well, I think uh, understanding that first of all, and the, and I think one of the first things parents get, especially coming together in a group like in the parenting class, because most parents come and they think they're the only ones dealing with whatever it is, or their kids are the only ones that do, do whatever they do. And they get in the class and they hear all these stories. And most of their parents are like, oh, wow, I don't have it as bad as I thought I did. <laughs> you know? And so to understand like most, if not many, many, if not most of the problems that you probably are seeing are not a result of you doing much wrong, right? You're, you, you know, you're, you're good parents. All kids are different. They all have different personalities and you can do the exact same parenting and get completely different results yeah. because yes. they're so different. <laughs> and, and this was a case in point, like my oldest and my youngest, they were pretty like, okay, I'm, I'm a pretty ADHD mom. I'm running all over like a chicken with my head. I'm doing 12 things. I'm not paying much attention. You know, I'm kind of just, I'm all over the place. And so my oldest and my youngest kind of just know that's mom, you know, they can get it. They can flow with it. My middle child did not like she could not handle it. And she would be screaming bloody murder. And I had a lot of conflicts with her and it wasn't until I found out, oh, actually it was, it was a, a, a teacher one time. I, I went to school and I said very wisely to her second grade teacher, I said, you know, Michelle, that's my middle daughter. She's one of those spirited kids. 
and the teacher looked at me like I was nuts. And she's like, I don't see that. She's great in the classroom. She gets good along with, every, with everybody else. She's respectful to me. And that's when I went, oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like this is a dynamic. That's when I got like, it was between her and I, this wasn't her. She wasn't a bad kid or a spirited kid or anything like that. I had intense interactions with her because of my dynamic with her. And so that's where it was. I think my responsibility, like what you, you're asking is how do we see each of them different? Well, whatever their personalities are, we're going to either clash with them or flow with them. And it could be the ones that are the same, which it mostly is, or it could be the ones that are different than us. But we have to understand that. We have to look at it and we have to know that. And so I, when, when I got that, like it really shocked me to have this, this teacher tell me this and gave me a lot to think about. And I actually made an appointment with a counselor and I took my daughter to, to a counselor with me. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Like <laughs> the teacher said this, and this is how I see it. And so the counselor had us play together for a session and we, we did this playing together thing. And then we went home and I went back for a solo session to get some help. And so she, the counselor told me, she said, as I observed the two of you playing, I saw that Michelle was very attentive and you were very interactive. So like, I would say here, let's do this. Why don't we do this? Blah, blah, blah. And she was just watching me like a hawk and waiting for me to pay attention, waiting for me to see her, waiting for me to listen to her. And so the coaching that I got from the therapist was, you need to be patient. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was really the gift that this child gave me. I had to learn to slow down. I had to learn to focus. I literally did not know how to do that. And I had to learn. And so it was a huge gift she gave me in that kind of backhanded way. And and it really did make a huge difference in our relationship. And even to this day, she's 31 and we have the best relationship. And she just touches my heart because she, she sees how we're say, the same. I mean, we, we, the clashing I think back then was, we're very, very similar in so many ways. And she loves that. Like she, you know, like I didn't like the way my mom and I were the same, right? <laughs> Like that, that, that didn't feel right to me, but she loves it and I love it. And it just, it's so fun for me to, ha and I know I have that because of the, again, the communication skills and tools that I learned and, and having this relationship. And so that's how I had to change in order to adapt to this one child who I couldn't parent just my natural way to parent. And all of us, I think have to do that. And if we see our children each, and you have four of them. So each one, like each one is it's their own unique person and you know what their personalities and their and their things are and to make sure that you see each one uniquely rather than seeing them all equally and to allow that to happen and that what i find when i'm coaching parents a lot of times is that there's behaviors that drive one parent crazy about a child one of the children and the other one is kind of checked out about it and if we get into the deep nitty gritty, often that child's behavior matches the parent who's checked out. <laughs> okay, there's a dynamic there where like that parent was like that when they were a kid or they had something going on like that. And so this one, the, this parent who's trying to deal with the kid and who's getting their buttons pushed by the kid is having their buttons pushed because it's, it's a similar behavior to their spouse. Mm -hmm. All right. So there's, there's a whole bunch of gunk going on there. And so if we can get down to this and if I can tease out like that trait that that child has, like with one parent, it was a kind of a morose kind of doomed sort of mentality and the child had it and the dad had it and the mom, it just made her nuts. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so when I was coaching, it's like, okay, mom, you're fired. You don't get to deal with this. Like dad has this, he knows what this is dad, you cannot check out anymore. Like your job is to work with your daughter on this. Like, you know what it feels like to have this kind of psychology and she needs your help. She needs to know how you figured out how to cope with this. And mom over here needs to just not be in the middle of it. Cause she, <laughs> <laughs> she's making it worse. She's making it worse for you. And she's making it worse for the child. So, you know, kind of figuring out who's 
better at what? And I think the two of you probably do this working yeah. as a team together and figuring out like, okay, you go take care of that. I'll take care of this. Like, you know, <laughs> See, you're laughing. Tell me what. Like, Tag team. Probably, you're yeah. up. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's like, I think if we all got to do the things that we're good at and, and feel good to us and we could delegate the things that are tough to an extent, I mean, we do need to grow and change. Like I said, I mean, I had to do some counseling here and there when I had things come up. And I think those are gifts, huge gifts that we give to ourselves, like taking some of that growth, but, but don't make it hard either, you know, mm -hmm. like make it, make it flow in your home so that everybody's happy as much as you can. No, for sure. Now, one thing that I'm very specifically curious about, and it's more so the things that as a parent are, are difficult for me <laughs> to deal with. So things that uh, most specifically I find as a challenge are when, or well, number one, whining. The, the whining really gets to me. Or when my kids just say that they, they can't do something or for whatever reason, they just don't want to listen. And, you know, especially when it's a really basic thing, like, you know, it's bedtime, go brush your teeth and it, it ends up being a long process. So what are some strategies that we can use to help I, I guess we'll start with the, with the whining. <laughs> okay. We got a long list. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it's so funny because like, as you were talking, it's like, okay, one, oh, two, three. Okay. Four things. <laughs> like you've got four different misbehaviors going on. So what I teach is systematic approach to parenting and this behavior. And so it's a way to identify when a child's misbehaving, identify why they're misbehaving and then have tools to correct their misbehavior. And it's funny because I, I do a little podcast. I just started dropping these little, I call them positive parenting pep talks and they're nice. four minutes a day. So they're short, not like these interviews I've been doing. They're, you know, they're <laughs> like little four minutes a day and you get little talk and whining, I think was within the last two or three days. It was, that was one of the tips. I had a couple tips about, but I'm gonna, I mean, I can expand more into it because we have more than four minutes here. So whining is associated with one of the four mistaken goals. So whenever your children are misbehaving, and we can think all four of your children and any misbehavior, whenever they're misbehaving, instead of looking at it like, oh, they just need attention, or oh, they're just like their mom or dad, or oh, they're stubborn or spoiled, all of those things, when we say those, oh, they're just whatever, it takes us down the drain, okay? Because what happens when we have those beliefs about why they're misbehaving. It's just that they're just whatever. It means that they're misbehaving. Therefore, they're bad. Therefore, I'm bad as a parent. I'm not doing my job right. And so I've got to get control of the situation. Otherwise, I'm a bad parent. So what, what have you noticed every time you try to get control of situations like this that you're talking about? I would say probably it depends because all of the kids are, are different, but these things, you know, all of these things will happen at some point. I guess probably the biggest challenge is that there'll be a, a you know, a power struggle kind of ensues. Right. And the, but, but, but mainly in general, when the more I try to get control of the situation, the worse it gets. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happens. I mean, and that's why having those old beliefs, they're stubborn, they're spoiled, they're like their mom whatever, they have bad genes, all of those things lead to this, I must be doing a bad job, I've got to get control. And every time I try to get control, it just gets out of control. So it's just this downward spiral. So instead, when a child misbehaves, we want to look at a child as having certain needs that they're trying to get met. And those needs are to feel loved, to feel valuable, to feel powerful, to feel like they have a place to experiment and explore to belong. And so when they're misbehaving, if I go, oh, my child's misbehaving, my child's discouraged. Discouraged from what? From getting one of those needs met, to feel loved, to feel powerful, whatever. And so you don't even have to know which one it is. Just understanding this general concept that if my child's misbehaving, then they're not getting their need met. And they're trying to get it met through this misbehavior. And so my reaction to that is, I can help my child get their need met through more appropriate behavior than this misbehavior that they're doing right now. So that's the kind of the general idea of this systematic approach to discipline. So your child's misbehaving and they're whining. 
I can't, I can't do it, I'm so tired. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a deep breath and you're gonna ask yourself in that moment when they're misbehaving, and it could be whining or it could be anything else they're doing, but I'm gonna use this example right now. So you're gonna take a deep breath and you're gonna say, how am I feeling? Which is not what you're likely to do, right? <laughs> no, so you would be, uh, be accurate in that assumption. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> And so that's why this takes a parenting class because we learn how to do this. It's a, it's a different way to handle it. And so you say, how am I feeling right now? And you take a deep breath. And when a child is doing the whining, I can't, when you take that deep breath and you feel how you're feeling, it's like, oh, I feel, you know, helpless, hopeless. I'm feeling sorry for them because usually they're, oh, they're so pathetic. You know? <laughs> and, and so I feel sorry for them. And if you don't feel sorry for them because they do this all the time, and sometimes parents stop feeling sorry for this child because they do it all the time. If you look at them and you see them doing this and you think how pathetic that behavior is, that also will lead to this, which is, this is one of the four goals and it's called the goal of inadequacy. And what that child's behavior is saying is, I feel helpless. I feel like I can't do it. But I know if I whine and if I cry and if I'm so helpless and I can't do it, you come over and you give me all this love and attention and I feel important. So I'm getting my need to feel loved or valuable or powerful or belong met through this misbehavior. So everything that we, the parent, do in service of this misbehavior, you know, trying so hard, oh, come on, honey, oh, you can do it, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff is serving the mistaken belief that says, I can't. I can't. And therefore, I, I, unless you're, unless you're helping me or feeling sorry for me, I'm not loved. So there's two main ways to redirect that particular misbehavior. The first one is what I call distract him and give it to him. <laughs> so, so usually the whining is happening around something, a task or a chore or some behavior. For example, my kids used to walk in after school and walk in the living room and drop their backpack on the floor. And I'd be like, pick up your backpack. I can't. I'm too tired. Oh, come on. You guys pick up your, I'm too tired. And so the redirection for this is to walk over. And I'd say, instead of getting into the whining inter interchange, which is servicing the misbehavior, right? It's servicing the misbehavior. It's giving them a goodie for the misbehavior. So instead of servicing the misbehavior, I'll just walk over to them with confidence and with assurance in my own mind that they're capable. Okay. So we have to, when we see them being pathetic and pitiful, we have to see them as capable in our own mind. So coming and approaching the situation that they're capable. And then I'll come up to them and I'll put my hand on their back and I'll say, wow, you must've had a really rough day today, didn't you? Because obviously they're so tired, they can't pick up their backpack, right? That must be true. And so I'll say it must have been a really rough day. And I'll actually lean over and I'll pick up the backpack. And when I hand it to them, they just take it. Mm. Now, if they're in one of the other goals, one of the goal, other goals is power. If they're in like the goal of power, when I hand them that backpack, they'll throw it either at me or down on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> because each of these corrective measures, which I'm talking about a way to redirect the goal of inadequacy right now, they only work with the goal that they go with. So this idea I'm telling you is only going to work with a child who's in this goal, this goal of inadequacy, which means that when they're misbehaving, we're feeling helpless, hopeless, you know, thinking how pathetic this is. Okay. So this isn't going to work in all situations. I want you all to know that. <laughs> So it's only for this particular goal. So I'll be like, oh, you know, like you must have had a really rough day. I'll hand them the backpack. They'll take it. As I'm talking to them, I'm walking them down the hallway. I'm saying, yeah, so maybe I'll make you some a snack and you can have a little break and then maybe we'll do something later. And I'll just be distracting them from how tired they are, right? We get to their bedroom and they throw the backpack in their bedroom and it's done. Like that's how I handle it in that situation. Part of the... Also part of this is, well, the, uh, the other idea, I guess, is what I'll say. So the other idea, so there's distract them and give it to them. The other idea is to break whatever's overwhelming them into smaller steps and celebrate in between. And this is a good one to use when your child goes into this goal, when they're doing their homework. Often kids are doing their homework. I'm tired. I can't do it you know, they're whining. And so if you can break it into smaller steps, how about if you do 10 minutes of homework and play outside for five minutes or 10 minutes or break it up in some way like that, or, or work for 20 minutes and break it up for 10. However, 
you think would be beneficial to your child. That's going to be super successful when the child's doing this particular misbehavior. And I have another good story of this one with my daughter, Michelle. So <laughs> when she was four, we'd get home from school and she, I had a little townhouse and with stairs and at one point in time, she would get home, she'd get to the bottom of the stairs and she'd go, I can't get up the stairs, I'm so tired. And I'm like, Michelle, you were just fighting with your brother in the car. You have plenty of energy, go up the stairs. <laughs> and, and she's like, I can't, I can't. So I would pick her up and I would carry her up the stairs. And the next day, the same thing would happen. We'd go through this whole thing. And this was going on for like two or three weeks. And finally I take out my book and I'm trying to figure out, okay, what's, what's wrong with this kid? And I'm going through it. And I'm like, oh, it's the goal of inadequacy. Cause you know, I'm, how am I feeling? She's despair, hopeless, helpless, pity thinking, how pathetic It's the goal of inadequacy. So I'm going to break this into smaller steps and I'm going to celebrate successes in between. So I, we get home the next day and I'm ready. And she gets to the bottom of the stairs. She's like, I can't get up the stairs. I'm so tired. And I get over next to her and I said, Michelle, do you think you can make it up three stairs? I don't know. Give it a try. <sighs> oh, good job, honey. How about three more? <sighs> way to go. And all the way up the stairs we did this way, breaking it into smaller steps, celebrating the success in between all the way up the stairs. The next day we get home, nothing. So it, she no longer, it took, we call it taking the wind out of their sails. So she was no longer getting the goodie. The goodie was me coming and rescuing her and carrying her up the stairs and engaging in the drama. And so that's what you want to think about is, is when this child is doing this whining thing, can I break it up into smaller steps? Whatever this thing is, is it overwhelming them? and celebrate the successes in between breaking it up? Or is there some way to distract him and give it to him if it's, <laughs> there's a thing involved? Like those to me are the two main things. And then finally, this is not always misbehavior. That in this case, sometimes kids whine and say they can't because they are in fact inadequate in an area. So you definitely want to evaluate that. And this could be the case with some homework. Like maybe it's a subject like some kids really can't do math. And so they'll get to their math homework and they'll just start whining and crying. Kids don't really have the ability to say, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Like that's, their egos don't allow for them to, to say that. And so they're gonna use their misbehavior to avoid doing something that they really don't know how to do because they don't know how to ask for help. So you need to evaluate that. That could happen with school. I had it happen with my older daughter with basketball, um, which is another story, but I don't know if I should tell you another story in case you want to ask me some other thing. <laughs> no, actually, I'd love to hear the basketball story. Let's go there. Okay. All right. So the basketball story. So same thing that we, we, oh, oh no, we were, um, okay. So Brianna, she was probably 12 and this is my oldest daughter. She's an artist. Okay. And that's since she was two, we always knew she was going to be an artist. She, all of her schoolwork, everything was about art and she gets to 12 years old. I think she was in middle school and she says, I want to go on the basketball team. She wants to try to play basketball. I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> so we put her on youth basketball and in, you know, the youth community youth basketball, and they have uh, try out, not tryouts, but a set, you know, you go in oh, and yes. they do whatever. And, and then they try to make the teams even, I guess is what they do. So we go yeah. do that. Uh, that was not pretty, but we did it. And they put her, <laughs> so they put her on a team and then we get this call and it says, we don't have enough coaches. Mm -hmm. If some parents don't volunteer to be coaches, then uh, we're, you're not going to have a team. And so I talked to my partner and he agreed to be a basketball coach for this youth basketball. And I know nothing about basketball, but, and he wouldn't do it alone. He's like, you have to help me with this because he could coach basketball, but he doesn't like to talk to anybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he did not want to deal with parents. So he's like, you have to deal with the parents. I'll coach the girls basketball. I'm like, okay, deal. And so we go out there, we're coaching basketball. And I know nothing about basketball, but I'm having fun. And what I learned is I can do stuff like I do in here. One time I got stuck doing the practice and um, I don't know what to do. And so I 
did like I do with parenting. And I said, okay, what do you guys have to do first? And they all knew, right? And then we're out there and they make a mistake. I was like, so what do you think? How would you evaluate that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to know basketball. The girls knew it all. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's not the story. So, so we would get out there and we would do basketball. And the first practice, like Brianna's throwing the ball backwards. She's getting hit in the face. They, he, my partner would tell her to tell the kids to go run and she's crying and she's, you know, 30 paces behind everybody. And all the kids are, are kind of, come on, Brie, come on, Brie, come on, Brie. Cause she's coach's daughter. So they're like being nice to her as much as they can, even though she was being awful. And so <laughs> this was like three, three or four practices and we're going out of our minds like this kid is miserable she is whining she's crying she can't do it and so again I'm going through my books I'm trying to figure out like what's happening okay it's the goal of inadequacy I got that and distractor and reader and redirector didn't sound right and break it into small steps didn't sound right and then I read and this is in the positive discipline book by Jane Nelson it said Sometimes kids go into the goal of inadequacy because they are in fact inadequate. <laughs> I was like, that's it. <laughs> she doesn't know. She can't, you know, she doesn't have any skills here. Like this is not her thing. And so I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? I'm looking for this like magic wand. And it's, it's not there. It was this idea of you need to do one-on-one -on -one skill building and bring them up to a level of adequacy so that they mm -hmm. feel capable and confident. And so that's why with schoolwork, with a, a subject, you want to give them extra support. So get them a tutor or spend extra time with them or whatever, you, some way support them in getting to the adequate skill level so they feel capable. So in this case, we had a chat with her and my partner said, how about if I spend, you know, an hour a day before practice and we'll do drills together and I'll help you learn how to do this. And she agreed. And so that's what they did. He took extra time one-on-one -on -one with her. I don't think it was every day. It might've been two or three days a week. And amazingly like almost right away her behavior improved so she would get to practice she would try she would try to catch the ball it didn't she didn't improve greatly <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but she stopped the the whiny behavior she stopped the helplessness she tried to catch the ball she ran as hard as she could to keep up with everybody she was no longer being this pitiful pathetic behavior and it and it really did turn into be a, a super fun she just wanted to get in and play they have I think it's five quarters of basketball and because it's community each kid had to play at least two quarters like that was the rule you had to put in you know kids have to play you can't oh, just yeah, play yeah. your good people the whole time and so she would do her minimum and she was happy to do that and she'd <laughs> sit and cheer everybody else on and <laughs> It was just, it was a great experience. Like it, you know, it could have turned out really awful, right? If we didn't know what to do or couldn't have transitioned from that whole whiny business. And so that's my story about that. There you go. <laughs> it, you know what? It's interesting that you say that because we're, you know, we may not say it to our kids like this, but we're big on like, not everybody is going to be professional basketball players, right? And, you know, the example comes to mind, our, our school's doing cross country right now. So the three older kids tried out or there they were on the team. And then when it came down to like actually, you know, almost having to make it to do, um, you know, go to another city, our oldest, and then our daughter, who's a twin, they made it, but her brother didn't. And he's like, oh, I'm horrible at this. I'm whatever. I'm like, no, here's the deal, bud. Just a reminder, you did cross country this whole time, knowing that you weren't going to come into in first place, right? But you kept going. Yes, you didn't make the team that gets to go to the other schools to run and stuff like that, but you tried. And, remi and reminding our kids too, that you're all going to be good at something, right? And it's going to all look different. But it's not, I think it's very easy to sometimes feel like, you know, there's that competition when it comes to maybe the athletics or even the arts, like just so many things. And just, I think as parents help guiding and nurturing our kids into their gifts, yes. right? So yes, you have anything to say on that one? <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, kudos to you. Great job having that conversation Mm because that's so important. And yes, and that's so true. And the way, the way that comes in the, in the positive parenting is that all kids have natural talents. Like I was talking about my daughter who's an artist and here she is trying out sports, which was great. Everybody should get to try everything. What often happens in stuck family dynamics, let's Mm -hmm. just say, is that one child will excel in an area and then the other ones give up in that area. And so what you'll have is a child who takes on a role. And so once that role's taken, the other kids have to pick something else. And this is where you get good kid, bad kid. You know, this one gets good grades. This one's a sports star. And when one of them picks that thing up, everybody else gives up in that area. Mm -hmm. So my older daughter being an artist, the other two continually would give up on art. And it's like, no, you can't give up on art. You're both you know, have your own talents. And I would, I did a lot of artsy things with the younger ones. Cause I could see it happening a lot of them, you know, giving up on being creative in that way. And so I, you know, spent a lot of time making sure that they did it. And I think have you having that conversation with your son and acknowledging his effort and his, the fun he put in and the time he put in and the way he did it. And competition is a funny thing. Mm. So competition <laughs> at home within the family can be super damaging competition between siblings. I mean, this, this starts with them racing to the car for getting whichever seat Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And so it, it causes conflict. It causes fighting competition in the sports realm is fine. Mm -hmm. And kids can learn how to deal with that and coaches coach them to win. But at home, if you have a winner, you have a loser. And so it's not a good paradigm by which to discipline our kids or motivate our kids Mm -hmm. between each other. And so we have a saying called helping kids to do their personal best rather than being the best. Because if you say, do do your personal best, the only person that they have to achieve over is themselves and what they've done before. And cross country, my, my grandson's doing cross country too. It's super fun. It's like, that's what their, their thing is, is getting their personal best every competition or every run or whatever they have to, they have to keep increasing their score against themselves, not against anybody else. It's like their own thing. And I love that at this age, he's only seven. So they're, you know, you don't, want to do super competition too young it's very the the research is in and and AYSO stopped counting the score of games until kids got to a certain age I think it's five or six or some something because they saw the research shows how damaging that kind of competition is to kids that are too young they just can't process it so I think that what I mean I just I love what you did I I don't have any suggestions for you just acknowledgements and like understanding and it's wonderful that he was willing to show up like you said and we do have pieces of helping them with handling their feelings. So if you saw him being super sad or disappointed to honor that, like I can see you're really disappointed and you wanted to get in there like your other brother and sister or whoever it was. And Mm -hmm. it's okay to be sad. It's okay to be discouraged, like letting feelings be okay. And sometimes you do that. I do that first. Because once, what do you want to do is say, it looks like you're feeling sad or it looks like you're feeling discouraged and you want to wait for a recognition response from your child. So when you land on the feeling, like if, if he was sitting there and, you know, kind of like this and you said, oh, you must, you, you look like you're feeling bummed about not making it. And if he goes, yeah, <laughs> that's when you've handled the feeling. So that's what you're looking for. You're throwing, you're lobbing out possibilities, how you think he might be feeling. And you're going to look for this, oh, like you get me you understand me. And then, then you move on and the conversation you have flows really well and they hear it. They usually need to get a feeling heard before they can hear the advice and the, all the, the heady stuff, right? The, the, how am I going to cope with my life in the moving on? They really need to have those feelings heard and under, seen, heard and understood. And it's neat because if you just throw them out as a question, oh, it looks like you're feeling really discouraged about that. Or it looks like you're feeling really mad about that. If you're incorrect, they'll go, no. And if you've been doing this a while, they'll go, no, but I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling this. And they'll actually correct you and let you know what they are feeling. And then you can honor that. And again, you have information. So now you can move on and have the conversation 
whatever you think. And that's, that's how I approach those sorts of situations. Handle a feeling, not fall in a big mush pot of feelings, just honor, acknowledge what you see in front of you and then move on. And that usually does really well. And it creates emotional intelligence in our children when we can do that. Now, if a, if a undesirable behavior, I guess what we'll call it is the, the underlying goal is power. Mm -hmm. How do we address that? Okay. Well, I, you know, I have a two hour workshop on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. I have all two hours on that subject because that's probably the most common misbehavior that drives parents crazy. It starts when they're about three and that the developmental stage of a three-year-old is where's my power and where are the limits? And so our job as parents with the three-year-old is to provide them with appropriate power and then appropriate limits on the power. And then as they grow, we have to keep giving them more and more appropriate power and kind of let those limits come out a little bit, you know, lessen the limits, increase the power as their age and stage allow it to happen. And what happens is if you learn how to do this, when your child is three, they'll move through this developmental task of where is my power and where are the limits? And you'll have a nice respite for the school age years where the power struggles won't be too intense. You'll have them that you'll be able to handle them. You'll be able to manage them. And then they get to teenage years and they do it again. They're going through a very similar developmental stage. It's called individuation when they're teens. And it's, who am I? Like now it's, now it's not a, like at three, it was a physical thing. Like, ooh, I'm not my mom anymore. I have a body and I have a mind and I can run around and do stuff. And how am I going to do stuff? And that's like, it's a physical individuation that they're doing when they're little. It's a social, emotional, spiritual individuation when they're teenagers. So who am I? Who are my belief wise? Who am I social wise? And they use the power struggles as the energy, the, the separation energy to figure out who they are. But it's the same developmental stage of separating from the parent or, or figuring out where's my power and then having to have limits on that power. So if you learn how to do it when they're three, then when they're teenagers, you'll have confidence, right? I, could, I did this when they were three. I can do it now when they're teenagers and the issues are a little scarier <laughs> and a little harder to handle. So in a nutshell, number one is to understand that the child who's in the goal of power feels powerless inside. Okay. So when your child misbehaves and you take that deep breath, remember, you're going to take a deep breath every time your child misbehaves and you're going to ask yourself what you're feeling. I haven't taught you all the goals yet because we've only had an hour here, but I'm going to teach you power now. And the power one is you're going to feel provoked and challenged. So if your child's misbehaving and you're like, Ooh, I'm going to wring their neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's power. All right. That's the power, the goal of power. So that's when you want to get in there and make them do something. And they're digging their heels in saying, I'm, you're not going to make me do it. That's a power struggle. That's, the, that's what the power struggle looks like. And so if you go from this other standpoint of, wow, my child's discouraged, discouraged from what? From feeling loved, valuable, powerful, et cetera. I can help them find a way to get that need met, to feel powerful through more appropriate behavior rather than this defiance they're giving me right now, okay? The defiance is inappropriate. The deliberate disobedience is inappropriate. The, you know, that's what's inappropriate. So we need to help them figure out a way to get that need met through more appropriate behavior. Hopefully you're going to take this deep breath, say, oh, I'm feeling provoked and challenged. My child's in the goal of power. My child feels powerless inside. This is the mistaken belief inside the child that's causing the goal. I don't know how to be powerful in my world appropriately, but I know if I defy you, if I don't do what you say, you get all mad at me. <laughs> I feel powerful. So us yelling at them and overpowering them and threatening them, all of those things feed the power struggle monster big time. It's that's what's that's what and and we we parents uh, don't know this and we'll say stuff like you're driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. They're like, I am in control of their emotions. Like this is power, <laughs> like nothing else. Yeah. So we have to understand that this is what is feeding that thing. And so understanding that inside they don't know how to feel powerful appropriately. They've picked up that they can get us going through being disobedient in a deliberate way. And so you take that deep breath. And the first thing you're going to think is, how can I 
navigate this being both kind and firm. Okay, so kind and firm is going to be your, your, your guidance for your parenting style to navigate this thing. Because if you're too kind, they're going to walk all over you, right? You, they need limits. Remember, this is that the developmental stage of power is they need limits, appropriate limits. If you're too firm, they're going to rebel all over you and dig their heels in and not because they need appropriate power. So that's your, your job is to navigate this middle area of kindness and firmness and not, not be too kind and not be too firm. And that's the first idea to keep in mind is keeping our own emotions. <gasps> okay. I have a friendly smile on my face. And in fact, in fact, when, okay, when your kids were one, what was their developmental stage? What was their, what was the main developmental thing that they do when they're around one, maybe a little older? I would say for our oldest, like he was walking. There you go. That's all I, that's, yeah, they walk, <laughs> right? They walk. And what, what do we do when they walk? The first steps. How do we <gasps> celebrate? Yay! Oh, grandma, <laughs> get a video! So when our teenager does their developmental stage of rebellion, what do we do? Well, I, no. I, I haven't celebrated. I'll say that part. <laughs> no celebration we don't exactly. celebrate it. We don't call, but we should. We should. It's the same thing. Like, why? Why is it that we get all mad when they're doing their their develop? Their, this is their developmental stage right now. Yay! He's rebelling. <laughs> this is it. So that's what I remember to keep my attitude in check when I'm dealing with the power struggles to remember my job here this child is being a kid their job is to shop for behaviors that work to get their needs met so their job is to shop how am I going to get my need met here how am I going to get my need met here and they'll often learn like this way works really good with dad and this way works really good with mom. <laughs> so they'll do completely different misbehaviors which e with each one, depending on how they get served in, mm. in the situations. And so parents often are really not very nice to each other when it's like, well, he doesn't do that with me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, we're all different. So they're gonna do different stuff. You know, he does something else with you, right? <laughs> and so be nice to each other because they just, kids learn, they learn how to get their needs met from us. They learn where our, our weaknesses are. It's all unconscious. They don't do, they're not out to get us. They're not trying to ruin our lives. They're just behaving so logically. And that's what I love about coaching parents. I can see this so clearly. Parents can tell me for a minute, like what's going on. And I can see why the child's doing whatever they're doing. It's just so clear to me from doing this so, you know, for so many years with so many different parents and so many different kids, their behavior always makes sense. It's driving the parent nuts, but the parent doesn't understand the things that they're doing to reinforce this behavior that's driving them nuts. And it always makes sense. Kids always make sense. Like they're, they're doing it because it's giving them a goodie. If it was not giving them a goodie, they would stop doing it. They would do something else. So that's what you have to be thinking when you're looking at this child who's power struggling with you to keep your attitude kind and firm. Okay. I go through 10 ways to get out of power struggles and 10 ways to prevent power struggles. So if you give me, give me an example of one of yours and I'll pick one, one tool to give you. How's that? Tell me a power mm. struggle that you've gotten into with somebody and you all. know what? I was just thinking as you were talking about this evening, it, you know what? I dropped it. So you can tell me if I did it the right way or not. So <laughs> I had to follow through with the consequence from last night. And I told my oldest, you're not going out tonight. He didn't think I was actually going to fall through. So he was surprised. So he stormed off to his room and I just left it. And then later, oh no, sorry. Right before that, I was like, you need to, can you please help put the groceries away? And he was coming up to do that. And then I said, remember, you're not going tonight. Well, I'm not doing the groceries and I'm not doing this. And then off he went. I just left it. Did I do that right? Did I do it wrong? Well, you might've because, okay. So when he said, I'm not doing the groceries, how did you feel in that moment? You know what? I felt... I actually, I looked at my watch and I'm like, I don't have the time to take this on. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, let me ask it a little differently. Did you feel more provoked and challenged when he said that? Or did you feel more hurt? Like, why is he doing this? To you me? know what? I actually felt like I would have said the same thing if I was his age <laughs> and my parents just told me. I, I actually felt like that. I'm like, I could see myself doing this. But I think normally, normally, I would have probably felt hurt. Like, just like you're being disrespectful. I use that awesome a lot. Awesome. <laughs> you're being disrespectful so you- right now. Okay. So, so what, what you just told me confirmed what I was thinking when you were telling me the situation, which was that he was not in the goal of power when this particular encounter occurred, he was in another goal, which is called the goal of revenge. Mm. And when your child is misbehaving in a way where you feel hurt or like you want to hurt them back. And I love that you were afraid. So yes, you did do the right thing there that then the child's goal is the goal of revenge. And what that child's behavior is saying is I feel hurt. And I'm going to make you feel hurt the way I feel hurt. So I'm going to take you down with, Mm -hmm. and that was very clear there because there was a punishment going on. And that's one of the downfalls of punishment is that it creates their goal of revenge in kids, which then we have to clean up. And you did a great job cleaning that up. One of the things that we do to redirect the goal of revenge, and now we're segueing, sorry, (laughs) (laughs) is to refrain from punishment in the moment. And you did job, you know, goal, step number one is postpone discipline because right now the relationship is damaged. It's disrupted. Mm -hmm. And so until you get that relationship intact again, you won't have influence. We have a saying in the parenting teenagers workshop rules without relationship Mm -hmm. equals rebellion. So you have to have that relationship solid before you can discipline. And so in this case, refraining from discipline is the perfect first step. Now, obviously you want to revisit it. I don't know if you revisited it yet or if you're going to later, but you need to, you know, you need to clean that up, obviously. Yes. And oh no, I was just going to say, so at bedtime tonight, because you know, he (laughs) was just quiet, right? This evening. And I just let him be. And I said, just a reminder, you do know why you didn't get to go last night or tonight, right? Because A, B, C, D. Mm. (laughs) so I did try to you know bring it back to this is why and because I'm not typically out of the two of us the best at like following through with my consequence (laughs) and discipline he probably was like really out of all times this is the time you're gonna follow through that's probably what he was thinking (laughs) but um yeah yeah and it's funny because it's funny that you say that because I didn't expect you to follow through I was just saying okay am I dropping him off now so I was ready to drive him and then (laughs) It's like, no, remember, you're not going. So, yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I think sleep, right? I mean, we could go on and on, but sleep is a big thing. And it's like, no, I need you to get sleep because if, as a preteen, teenage, well, anybody, right? But if you're not getting enough sleep, guess who is impacted by it? It's the rest of us. And that's for me too, right? If I'm yes. miserable, then the rest of us. So, no, we have to keep things balanced. Right. Okay. Okay. So we've gone a little bit over, but I really want to, no, 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 this has been great. Us too. But I really want to end this conversation by asking this question. So how can a family create more closeness and connection? Oh gosh. There's so many ways, but I think, I think to like use your last name. Okay. And call everybody the whatever kids, my kids, uh, my last name back then was Kreitzer. It's like Kreitzer kids. We need to let's go do this or Kreitzer kids. Let's do that. So kind of being a team and finding Mm -hmm. a lot of ways to be a team. Let's all go do this. Let's all do that. Let's putting all of us in the same boat together and connecting, creating, creating family time together, all everybody participating, you know, doing family meetings in a positive way. The old way was there's a family meeting. Uh Oh, who did it? Hmm. No family meetings should be a time to do bonding, to do Hmm. acknowledgements, to do, we call them love about you's to set personal and family goals, to create, like, let's have a family night out or do a family game night. So just being on a team and really talking that, talk speaking that and speaking it into existence and being it with your children all together i think that's one of the best ways to create closeness in our families ah that's great awesome now i have one more thing as well right we've heard about (laughs) brie and we've heard about michelle so i I guess can we assume that your son was the the child that didn't cause any problems (laughs) nope (laughs) (laughs) no and i adore him and he was but he was he was 
he was a great kid. And I realized very early on, like four or five, if I don't learn how to discipline him with words, uh, he's going to be able to beat me up when he's like nine. <laughs> like he, I could see the, the potential, like if I did, if I had to use physicalness, you know, when parents who spank or do all those things, there's a certain time where your kids get bigger than you and now you're in danger. (laughs) (laughs) And I saw that really early on with him, like, wow, this kid could really dig his heels in. And I learned the biggest thing I learned from him is that he'll do the right thing, but in his own time, like in his own time. One time he I, the girls came in, mom, Michael just put his gum on top of the trash can lid. It's just sitting there. It's really disgusting. And I just walked in and I'm like, peanut gallery, go away. Michael will do the right thing. And I walked out of there because I knew if I said in the middle of the girls all Michael, this Michael, that if I said, Michael, go do that, he would dig his heels in and he wouldn't do it. Cause he was a, definitely, and he still is, he's 30. He will still, I, I still know this about him. Don't make him try to do something immediately give him time to do the right thing and so he would he would go and and so I I walked out of there and I kept peeking down the hallway and looking at the trash (laughs) and the gum was still there and it was driving me crazy the gum is still there it was like 20 minutes later when we all forgot about it and then he went over and he plucked the the gum off the trash can and and put it inside and that took me all through his teen years, like when he had to mow the lawn or take the trash out, any, any of his jobs, I had to tell him, do it. And sometimes I would say, how long do you need to do this? Like, do you need 24 hours or something like that? Like, can you commit to being able to do it in the next day? And I would just make sure if I needed a time frame that I gave a bigger one than really was necessary just so that he had that time. And then the other thing that I learned from him was he does not like words. He did not like words. He does not like words. I talk way too much. Quit talking. That's where we'll get in fights and and stuff. So I learned don't talk to him too much. But if I need to talk to him, we go to nature. If I take him hiking to the beach, go for a bike ride, go play tennis, anything physical and out in nature. And if I keep my mouth shut, he'll start talking and he'll talk my ear off. And it's amazing if I don't talk how much he talks. <laughs> and that's still true today too at 30 years old. <laughs> so yes, I love that kid and I definitely learned things from him as well. <laughs> awesome. So Debbie, we got to ask, where can we find you online? Yes, positiveparenting.com. That's my website. Okay. And I do have positive parenting pep talks on all the podcast on all the platforms now okay. uh, just started that a month ago so uh that's something yes three to five minutes I don't even think any of them have been five minutes yet but further down I have I have about 200 of them because I have them set up to do every day forever and so <laughs> yeah lots of little five minute pep talks so come on and visit those uh and at positive parenting Debbie on Instagram and I'm on LinkedIn as well so great you can find all those yes awesome well, thank you so much, Debbie. We appreciate the time and uh, we appreciate the, the knowledge and insights. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And it's been such a fun conversation. You two are awesome parents. I love it. Thank Very you. positive parents. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. We're trying. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a great job. Patrick, thank well done that. Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday.